But I think procurement is going to become increasingly more data-driven as we go forward in the future. And fortunately, among the audiences I talk to, you guys are certainly among the most advanced when it comes to spend analysis. There are many I analyze customers I spoke to in the room yesterday and this morning who are doing fascinating things with data sets, going far beyond just looking at things like purchase price variance and taking into account inventory information, risk, diversity data, all very exciting stuff. Today, I'm going to talk about the transformation of procurement. This is a topic we've heard far too much about over the years, so I'm not going to bore you in the different stages of transformation or how AD Kearney's strategic sourcing process differs from Deloitte's or somebody else's, but we're going to get into some real facts about the space and where I think things might be going and provide some scenarios for change at the end in terms of where this whole market might be in a decade's time. I'm going to kind of fly by on technology and talk about some of the more macro issues, but I might go deep in certain areas as necessary. Some quick background on the company I, I founded and worked for. We covered the procurement supply chain markets. Um, I'm going to pull some data into, the, into slides here. Even though we do a lot around technology on spend matters, we also have uh, the biggest trade publication in metals in North America right now online. We cover the healthcare procurement market through healthcare matters. And we've got a site in the UK called Spend Matters UK Europe, which does a lot around both private sector and public sector affairs in the UK specifically. Um, we also have a premium content service called Spend Matters Pro. So if you want to go deep on any of the issues you hear in here, we publish a lot of research uh, on the sector. But there's a lot which is free on the public sites as well. So I'm going to divide my talk into really three sections and just a few graphical tips at the end as well. Fighting fires today. You know, we are in the center of this maelstrom, and I'm going to talk about why and how we can get past it. What are some of the priorities we're seeing? And these are tactics you can begin to deploy today if you're not already. I want to close the main part of the presentation with where we're going to be in a decade's time. I've got five different scenarios for the future of procurement, some of which I think are more exciting than others, but some of which might be where we're headed based on what some organizations are doing today. I'm going to toss a lot of data up here today, but I do think being data-driven, whether it's looking at spend data or whether it's looking at the macro issues, is so critical. Um, the superficial fluff that passes, that passes for Romney and Obama debate around business issues and trade is so high level, I think you really need to dig into the trenches. But please don't fact check what is up here. That would, that would not be good. Um, the world economy is, is a bit of a mixed bag right now. Certainly the signals are negative, right? We have serious issues with Greece, big questions over what's going happen, happen to happen to the EU. The U.S. is up, but it's only slightly up, and there are some concerns, still nagging concerns over unemployment, which is quite scary where it is, especially if we count those who are no longer qualifying for unemployment but are still unemployed. There are a few bright spots in the market. Um, India, Israel, Ireland, three eyes uh, are bucking the trend, but lots of challenges in general. One element, though, which I think is fascinating, and I'll tie back later in the presentation, is the non-manufacturing index, the NMI. The NMI uh, it's not something most people track. Most people look at the PMI and just assume it's manufacturing data, which is above. Mixed bag, we had contraction in the summer of under 50, growing last month above 50. But the non-manufacturing index is fascinating. We've had nearly three years of consecutive growth in the services industry in North America. So despite challenges in manufacturing, the services industry is growing. And as we'll talk about later, services is a huge opportunity for us to turn our cannons to in procurement. But just a quick, a quick overview of the economy. I think this is so important to looking at demand going forward, looking at negotiation tactics and such with suppliers. You know, to start, European GDP has dipped into pigs territory. I love, I love that picture. Um, you know, the, the, the uh, Irish markets and some others, and notwithstanding, uh, things are not good in Europe. Uh, lots of concern over, over those pigs nations, Greece in particular, um, and we're seeing negative, negative growth at this point. Um, China GDP. I'm sure many of you have got operations in China, sourced from China. I give a lot of talks on low-cost country sourcing, kind of the end of it in China sourcing. There are still places uh, and, and big initiatives you can pursue in China. If you're selling locally, uh, if you're trying to enter the market more aggressively, it makes a lot of sense. If you're buying a widget, part component, you can fit into a shoebox. The arbitrage might still make sense to bring it here. But in general, the China cost has risen dramatically. The numbers to look at in China, you can look at is the HSBC index, which is far more accurate. And HSBC actually shows the PMI in China, again, China, not US, in decline right now. This is scary. 
uh, it's scary for a lot of reasons, and not to harp on politics, but what happens with China when cost, demand go down, Chinese government pushes out exports and dumps products on the US. Then eventually you get World Trade Organization cases, you get Obama and Romney complaining about, about Chinese dumping practices, but it's not a sustainable situation. There are some great forecasters you can talk to in this world. On the metal miner side, we have some, and, and John Anton at IHS does a great job with his forecast as well, but it's a scary situation. We've also seen a lot of volatility in commodities. Key, key piece, right? 2011 commodities were the headline. But if we look at what's going on today, and this is just our data on the metal miner side, so we have what we call the metal miner index, the MMIs, and we track uh, global metals. So for example, we have an aluminum index which tracks aluminum prices globally. We have one for rare earths, we have one for raw steels, the inputs to steel. Um, and then we also track metals on an industry basis, so what goes into the automotive industry? what goes into the construction industry, what goes in, into the renewables industry. And as you can see from looking at this, and I'll zero in on the next slide with some examples, despite the decline uh, in the European economy, despite concern in China, despite uncertainty here, there's been tremendous volatility this year, and we need to manage through it. You know, the rare earth index, and our baseline is 100, so it's done like, like the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so the baseline from January of this year is 100. Uh, we see roughly 50% decline in rare earth since then. However, other, other industries have, have, have ticked back up. So in September, we saw a 3% gain in the automotive MMI, so steel and other, and other metals. Copper has seen significant volatility this year. If you're going to track one metal for forecasting purposes, in the general economy, copper is the one to track. There's a very large diversified manufacturer, one of the biggest, who places their global bets uh, looking at copper as the leading indicator. Uh, and they're a user of copper, but moreover, how copper is used in the global economy is a key element of what they look at. So, what's going on in this climate? You know, we're increasingly working with suppliers in a very complex, unforgiving economy. We've got trade imbalances, you heard about that last night uh, and the week before. Total cost hiccups, I'm sure many of you have sourced globally and have seen the price go up 20-30% in the past few years. Um, and we've got different definitions of acceptable behavior. Nobody's here from Apple, right? Okay, good. I was, giving, I was giving a talk on supplier performance and risk, and there was somebody from Apple in the audience a couple weeks ago, and I mentioned a Foxconn incident, and I forgot the person was there, and I started to cringe. But at Foxconn, when they had suicide problems, uh, they put up nets in the dorms. Nets. That's how they dealt with it. And hopefully they had psychological counseling as well. If we had worker suicides anywhere in the Western Hemisphere, we'd do a lot more than put up nets. So we've got different definitions of acceptable behavior. Um, currency and commodity volatility touched on that already. Uh, you, you know, my favorite junk food is Greek food, and you can see my sandwich down there. So, would you like some some QE3 with that gyro? Demand signals. Um, the, the demand signals, if you're working in China right now, have dropped dramatically in the past 60 days. There's um, there's questionable demand as well. There was some really interesting data in the PMI uh, in August and September looking at, at the declining demand in the U.S. It has picked back up a little bit, but lots of concerns. And then within this, we've got to look at, at liquidity and suppliers. It's very easy for us. Most of us work for big companies with you know eight credit ratings. We can borrow so cheaply. Same as at home right now. I was able to refinance my house on a 15-year mortgage and get a crazy rate recently. If, you, if you've got good credit, you can borrow. But if you're a small supplier, a medium-sized supplier, if you're a supplier in Greece, Spain, or Italy, much harder to borrow at this point. So we've got to think about how do we work with those suppliers in those countries. We've got lots of other risk factors behind the scenes too. Duncan, Duncan touched on some of them when he talked about supplier performance and risk management as well. Um, but we've got to think about material and substance level compliance. I'll talk about that a bit later. Um, we've got lots of companies who've teamed with HR when it comes to contingent labor spend, and they're now not uh, pursuing categories, shall we say, properly to drive savings and compliance, but they're implementing SOW programs as workarounds based on worker classification issues. It actually gives you less visibility and not more around certain compliance areas. We also have challenges uh, around inventory, and I'll talk about inventory here in the form of virtual goods and risk. There was one organization we interviewed a couple years ago who was looking at a backup plan after the wake of a major major BPO fallout overseas. And this it, was mostly for IT hosting, but some value add around it as well. And what they found when they gamed their backup suppliers, 
they so they were segmenting their spend 70% one to one, you know, 15, 15, two, 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 the other two. But they found if their key supplier went under and they had to shift out their hosting capacity uh, and centers uh, in India, that everybody else who they competed against would go to these other suppliers, and there was not enough capacity in the market. So literally, those who didn't partner with those smaller suppliers right now would not have the capacity if needed if a major supplier went under. So that changed their strategy. They actually changed and changed their spend profile in terms of who they gave it to, splitting it out more. Um, lots of priorities going on in the past. So in the rearview mirror, and some of these I'm sure you're, you're living through today, obviously driving incremental cost reduction. Capacity challenges have been a very big deal the past couple of years, especially in retail, CPG, around the holiday season. Um, I talked about compliance and risk. We'll, we'll double click on that a bit later. We've also seen something that was very interesting in, in 2011. We saw procurement organizations really look at, at different models of service delivery. So in certain cases, it was embracing shared services more, uh, looking at, at, at the uh, F&A side, the AP side. We also saw contingent staffing in procurement. A lot of organizations we talked to didn't have enough budget to get headcount full-time or hire consultants, but they could hire contractors. So a, cha a changing model from a staffing perspective. But where are we going now? So within past years, so 2012, what are the major priorities we've seen in, in our research looking at this market? A much greater emphasis as you go up the executive ranks, CPO, CFO, around anticipating and forecasting cash, revenue, demand, and mapping to procurement and working capital strategies during a likely downturn. I believe there's going to be a recession later in 2013. I don't think uh, it matters who wins the election. But what happens if that's the case? What happens from a planning standpoint? We've looked at risk management and commodity management. Services procurement, hold that thought for a minute, but we're seeing greater expansion into broader services categories. And we're seeing a, a newfound enthusiasm for, for total cost, especially manufacturing. So we're really getting into total cost models, looking at inventory, working capital, unit cost, logistics, and tax. Tax is a very interesting one if you operate on a global basis, and I'll talk about that in a minute as well. Yet if you look at where we are today, some of these things may seem strategic, but we're still often fighting buyers. I'm worried about procurement being financed as Poodle, because Poodles get kicked, and we've got to be careful that we're not just implementing somebody else's program because we have to. I think we've convinced ourselves that we've become strategic. I think the, the creation of the CPO title is a great example of convincing ourselves. But ultimately, I believe looking at what classifies as strategic, we've got to look at salaries relative to the rest of the organization, whether that's finance or sales. I'm not going to double click on that now, but the salary issue is one which will tell you a lot about how procurement is valued. Typically, the more folks are paid for strategic types of functions, and there's some great hacking data on this, the, the more or uh, the better the procurement organization performs. Tactical is different. So just a few questions to, um, uh, to ask yourself today, how you're viewed and if you're viewed as strategic. If, 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 if procurement is more strategic, why can't it build business cases for high levels of staff and technology investment more easily? So why can't we double headcount? If we're giving a very strong reported ROI, why can't we add more? Does finance and our board of directors believe our savings numbers? And then why do salary deltas still exist within procurement management and sales and commercial organizations? I think those are critical questions to ask, and they can be painful, but they're important. So if we want to start fires, though, and get beyond that, what can we do? I'm going to talk about five initiatives. These are ones we can spend a day on each, so I'm going to fly through them. The first is tackling services procurement more aggressively. I'm going to build into these, so don't worry if you didn't read them all. But services procurement, we believe, is a huge opportunity. Many of us have gone after uh, basic indirect categories, MRO, IT, some aspects of telecom. Maybe, maybe we're touching on direct decisions as well. But the opportunities around contingent labor, marketing, print, legal are huge. But it's not just about savings. It's about value, and I'll talk about that equation in a minute. Um, I'll give you one example from a legal sourcing perspective. Yes, you might be able to haggle around fees a bit. You might be able to kind of right-size your supply base. But let's just take the hypothetical example of your company engaged in lots of merger and acquisition activity. And your strategy from a legal procurement standpoint might not be to get the best rates. Your strategy, and not that I've heard this, so I can't confirm or deny it, but your strategy might be to conflict out as many firms as possible so that your competitors can't use those firms and attorneys. So that's a perfectly acceptable legal sourcing strategy. It might not be about savings, but procurement might be involved in how do you conflict out firms. Great point here. Price is what you pay, value is what you get. 
So when we think about complex services, the basic services, whether it's construction, architecture, janitorial, legal, professional services, BPO, you name it, we've got to think about the value equation. And we've got to think about the types of technology we use as well. You know, a, a sweet vendor like Zykus can give you very solid end-to-end -end procurement technology, yet there's also specific services procurement technology for different categories. Marketing is a great example. The, the analytics and marketing spend, especially if you're doing competitive and you want to hold your agency a record accountable, are very different. Whatever you do, though, don't take software from that agency. They push it as well, but they're going to tweak it to show as good a job they're doing. Um, but critical to seek out that specialized technology in more advanced cases. It's important to show the business that sacred cows can sometimes eat garbage as well without knowing it. So whether it's, it's, it's IT spend, whether it's audit spend, legal, accounting, you name it. Um, we might be very happy with our incumbents, I, I say we, but the business. But the business might not know what they're getting today. So how can we show them that even though, yes, your spend is sacred, but you don't really know what you've been eating recently, there's a few things we can do. I think benchmarking is a key element. We've seen that used so successfully. So we're not going to go through a sourcing process. We're going to go through a benchmarking process. And we're going to show you what you're getting today relative to others. Being empathetic, a key piece. And then selling the afterlife of going after these categories. Finding senior stakeholders, especially a CFO who's passionate about, and it's becoming easier to do this as well, even with audit spend. Um, having a CFO who helps drive these initiatives and will be the guinea pig because if the CFO is doing it, everybody else is going to agree to it as well. And just a quick tip from Florence. Uh, loved, loved the Ptolemy and, and examples. I'm sorry to throw up uh, a picture of the David. Actually, com coming from, uh, New <laughs> and, and from, and from New Orleans right now, this is somewhat appropriate given uh, the nature of this town. But great story about the David. If you've never been to Florence, I went for the first time recently. Strongly recommend you go. The David is this masterpiece, right? Um, it was done by Michelangelo. Michelangelo had patrons. Procurement has patrons in the business. Uh, Michelangelo uh, was, this is a story, nobody's quite sure if it's true, but our tour guide told us, told us at the time. Uh, Michelangelo uh, was working on the David, and one of the Medici came in, looked at it, and said, Michelangelo, I'm sure he used his hands. Uh, it's perfect, but the nose is not right. So Michelangelo could have told him to, Go fly a kite. He didn't do that. Picked up some dust from the ground, he put it on the nose, reshaped it. The Medici representative said, ah, oh, perfect. As soon as he walked out of the room, he did that. You know, brushed off the dust. But that story is a great example of how we need to humor our patrons. So we might be doing the right things, but if they have something to add, accept it, smile. Don't tell them they're wrong, and then wipe off the dust. <laughs> Educating finance. Engage finance. Don't be their poodle. Remember that. But educating them is important. I'm not going to go through all these bullets. Slides will be available. But just explore things such as e-invoicing. Explore P2P. Look at how we can drive end-to-end -end results here. Stopping matter purchasing is wonderful, but it's far better if we could, through P2P implementation, drive 50% adoption of supplier discounts, right? Huge impact on, on, on our ability to, to drive balance sheet improvements. And if we get this right, we're also going to have much greater visibility into our suppliers. Um, unfortunately, PowerPoint would not scale down to like 0.5 point. So I had to actually put this in a PDF and shrink it down even more. But these are some common fields. Uh, we do a lot of work around supplier management and setting, setting up fields and systems and what you need to track, for example, for supplier onboarding, whether it's banking, details, relationships, the kind of information you need to, ma to ma maintain. And we maintain about 250 basic fields, very basic ones you want to have up-to-date information on. And you can drive suppliers to continuously update that for you and you're doing the validation. Really big opportunity. Um, we could spend a whole day talking about tax optimized supply chains and how procurement can target the top line as well, whether it's through new product introduction, discount management, working capital strategies, huge opportunities. One procurement organization in Europe even relocated its entire team to Luxembourg and started a procurement company which then sells to the other organization for tax advantages. That is a huge opportunity compared with sourcing if you look at the numbers. Um, you can use a spend cube such as ICUS to look at, at VAT animation strategies, for example, for hotel nights in the UK, if you have enough nights and it's foreign nationals. Um, you can do transfer price analysis. You can even reclassify discounts now. Uh, 
the UK government and the US government gave its blessing to a new black box system to reclassify discounts as income if you do it properly. Uh, opens up a huge world of opportunity of actually securitizing your spend going forward. It's early days and it's quite scary and that will be a bubble if there's uptake on that, but lots of opportunity to think about that top line. We see a lot of organizations taking risk off the table as well, so exploring commodity management as a key example here. What, what are these companies doing? They're looking at aggregating the buy um, to really not only gain visibility, but drive strategies around hedging to buy forward in the rising markets, so on and so forth. We also see a lot of companies looking to take risk off the table, uh, exploring broader commodity management strategies. And I'll get into sourcing in a little bit and how that ties into it. But great quote here from a very advanced procurement organization. We, we want to get better at explaining the unexplainable. Not just understanding and having a forecast where the market's going, but being able to explain when correlations break down. Why do we think that rare earths are not going to go up 40%? Or why might they? Commodity management is a new sector overall, but it's one we see significant interest in. It comprises many different products. You can do commodity management and risk management across a range of platforms. So we see companies using price indices, we see specialized demand aggregation tools. You can do a lot of this in spend analysis as well. You can do it in Zytus. But I bet people don't know what, what certain organizations here are doing, and I think it's a great opportunity for this group to share best practices around it as well. There's a play for sourcing here and for contract management tools. There's also a play, though, for very specific commodity management suites as well, especially for hedgeable commodities. So I would encourage you to look at this area as a chance to become more strategic. Another major opportunity we see is redefining sourcing and reorienting the sourcing mindset. So getting away from this notion of reverse auction should comprise the bulk of our sourcing efforts. Yes, there's a place for them. I was guilty in doing them for many years and absolutely loving them. I remember the first reverse auction I, I worked on, having been a sourcing consultant on it, I felt like it was my birthday or it was, it was Christmas or Hanukkah. I was going to unwrap, unwrap a present around the savings we would get. And it's exciting. You've done work and yes, you can get savings. But thinking about a portfolio approach to sourcing. How do we let negotiations become information discovery processes? And I'd strongly urge you to look at sourcing optimization. So I guess I started to embed this in their capabilities. There's other providers as well. But look at how you can retool from reverse auctions and sealed bid RFX to using optimization to begin to apply your own constraints. So rather than creating a lot structure, you know, 10 lots of you know, 100, 100 parts or components each, or a smaller market, toss those over to suppliers, have them come back to you with their preferred breaks. You know, they can ship in this quantity and give you a price break. And then you can go back and negotiate that. You can also apply your own constraints against it. For example, what is the best cost solution where I'm giving a minimum 20% spend to diversity suppliers as part of, a, as part of an award decision? Sourcing optimization is just a huge opportunity. The last area I'll talk about where procurement can be a fire starter today is supplier management. Duncan touched on this already, did a great job, so I'm going to fly through it. But if we look at the opportunity for supplier management today, we can really begin to, to unite different functions, right? We can tie in the direct materials and materials managers and global procurement teams on the direct side. We can tie in frontline procurement for supplier onboarding. We can tie in quality and supply chain and bring this all together. Um, and if we do supplier management right, we can begin to, I won't say take over, but we can begin to lead the effort around things such as reducing product recalls, such as driving compliance from a regulation standpoint for new product launches. Uh, we can be on top of natural disasters, and we can make sure that our suppliers come back on board first, and we get supply when they come back. So what are, so what are some areas we see today conflict application of supplier management to, to procurement issues? Similarly, the, the, the avoidance of conflict minerals is a major one. We're seeing a lot of uptake there right now and interest in tools for this. Um, we're seeing tools used around safety and quality standards, uh, corporate social responsibility programs, using supplier management uh, as, as kind of a means to track factory audits, government watch list. I apologize for the eyesore on, on the right here, but the vision here is that we're combining data from our own systems, we're combining it from procurement systems, uh, ERP, MRP, compliance systems, risk systems, government watch lists, and we're also combining our supplier data as well. So we're getting a visibility into what's happening. 
This diagram, it may seem like the future, but it's possible today. There are companies taking tier one and tier two supplier data along with their own data to get a view as to what is going on within supplier management. Just some very quick afterlife stories. There was one high tech company that was able to launch a market in the EU on schedule despite new regulation because procurement stepped up to the plate around multi-tier compliance around region Rojas. Um, one other example I'll cite here as well is a set of hospitals and IDNs uh, in the healthcare space who can validate that any supplier personnel, so consultant, contractor, anyone who steps foot on premise has had their vaccinations. Literally, they're taking supplier management and tracking down to the contractor level around vaccinations before these folks enter a clinical setting. Fly through these with five quick scenarios and expectations for tomorrow. Go through each of these in order. The first scenario in a decade's time, extreme localization and decentralization requires new approaches. We're beginning to see this already, but as we go after procurement in local markets, if you're, an a, if you're an aerospace and defense company, for example, and you want to sell in India and China, you've got to recruit local suppliers because of offset agreements. That requires making sure they meet local standards. It also ensures that they meet local standards in the U.S. so you're not in violation of the Foreign, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, or FCPA. But we've got to go after meeting these local requirements. And if you look at you know, the rising prices of fuel, rising costs of energy, the supply risk inherent in working with overseas suppliers in Japan, for example, Ford had a single paint supplier for two key colors, um, which was taken offline in, in the Japanese tragedy last year. So how do we source locally? I think it's going to change how we go about and look at our supply chains. I think we're going to potentially see a move away from centralization to decentralization around suppliers. I think this is a key theme and scenario that we can see more of in 10 years. I also think we're going to see the possibility uh, around procurement getting far greater involved in politics, regulation, philosophy, economics. Being on top of these issues, being the interface for the company around what's going on. You might have a chief economist in your organization if you're a big company, but you know, having a point of view, what happens if the Suez Canal shuts down because of terrorism or conflict with Israel or Iran? What happens? What happens to our goods on the water? What happens if China keeps flexing its muscle around our earth metals? We've got to have a view on these issues. The next scenario, and these aren't mutually exclusive, is new technology proves insanely great and changes the game for good. I think this one is fascinating to look at. It's great to see what folks like Zykus are up to on products today, but how we deploy those products from Zykus and others in the future on new interfaces, how they touch the iPad and the iPhone, uh, is going to be key. How, how are apps, how are things we do voice activated? What is the role of video in the future? I would encourage you to get smart on these because I think they're going to drive our technology usage in a decade's time. There's some underlying technologies which are going to help as well in memory databases, true virtualization in the cloud, literally being able to scale up and scale down. And then, as Duncan alluded to and got into, supplier networks, I believe, are going to be a very big deal as well. If you're not using networks today and you don't understand them, I would urge you to get smart on them. The final, or fourth, two more to go quickly, scenario, global supply chain intelligence di dictates winners and losers. So organizations which can be out in front, which can look and proactively uh, consider and predict aspects of supply chain risk, those who've got a point of view around forecasting and commodities, those who are informing the budgeting and planning process, have got a huge opportunity to help drive their organizations going forward. And I, I do believe, and we're seeing it already in trading companies like Cargill, but those who literally kind of married procurement and trading together to gain advantage in the future. I think that's going to cascade into CPG, into retail, into manufacturing through global supply chain intelligence. The last scenario, and th this is the not so exciting one, but I think it's a distinct possibility, is that core procurement is absorbed when we go back to purchasing. Um, you know, it used to be called, ISM was not always the Institute of Supply Management. It was once, once called the NAPM. Uh, and purchasing was a function which today, uh, some of us are proud to be from, but it's probably not one that we want to go back to. Less opportunity, for example. But if we look at where certain things are headed in companies, you know, we look, for example, at how certain aspects of procurement are being absorbed by other functions. Supply risk management is a great one. Lots of organizations are now tackling procurement risk management within finance. There's oftentimes an ex-procurement person within finance, internal audit, or somewhere else doing it on behalf of finance. If we look at how, at how direct materials really stays within the business, Yes, we can source you know, machining, a casting, a plastic injection mold apart, a component, but those ultimate award decisions and inventory decisions still rest within the business. 
Um, and if we look at how finance is getting more involved and excited about, you know, how can they help realize savings, what is implemented versus identified, how purchase to pay systems are, are now being reviewed by CFOs as well. If we look uh, at how P2P is tying to working capital, I think there's a real chance that corporate procurement could be absorbed. So, something to think about because we don't want it to happen. So that ends the main part of my talk. I've got a few final pictures, which I'll close in about 90 seconds. I know I've gone a bit over. Um, some tips. Don't be finances poodle. Stop and think about why we, we've not been able to get our full allowance request. I love this picture. Um, why haven't we been able to get more money for initiatives, to hire, to fund tools? How can we be strategic in somebody else's view? Get smart on technology. Uh, don't be this kid in this bouncy chair reaching for the keyboard. And Last, on, on a serious note at least, focus on starting fires, not just fighting them. Um, you know, hopefully we're not a kid with a flamethrower, but we want to start those fires and get involved. Finally, last, it's important to know when to cash in your beads. I got a few last night. I won't claim how I got them. Um, and on that note, to be totally politically incorrect, don't be afraid to ask, show us your spend. Thank you all. Um, I know it was a lot of material. And